Listener Production. I'm automotive commentator and journalist Greg Rust, and this is Rusty's Garage. Hey, this is Rusty. Welcome to the second instalment of my chat with Victor Bray. If you haven't listened to the first part with the drag racing icon, be sure to check it out so you're up to speed. We recorded among the trophies and memorabilia at Victor's workshop here in Queensland with his dogs wandering in and out of the office. On the other side of the wall are the team's race cars in their bays being worked on by his son Ben and members of the team. There's a relaxed feel about the place. The Brays are just good people. Oh, and a collector is turning up later, hoping to sell Victor another car, so we better get back into it. To kick off part two, I asked him about how the tomato farmer from Queensland learned to become a showman. You are a bloody good showman, mate. You, you understand that in this sport uh, how important the fans are, and I want to cover a couple of bounds here. Nathan Prendergast is a is a friend of mine. He's the yeah. boss of Supercars Television these days, and he can fondly recall being a little tacker at the Summer Nats, probably with his dad, Kevin, who's been running yeah. race tracks around the country, and he can recall you doing the biggest skid of all time, the biggest burnout of all time, and he was like, "Wow, who is this guy?" <laughs> side aside from that, I, I've watched you. I've been fortunate enough, I think it was at, uh, at Western Sydney, to stand right near the Christmas tree and watch you take off down the lane and and pull a big burnout because it wound the fans up before mm. before the run. And then finally, mate, in, in this long-winded question that I'm asking here, I, I sense in you a bit of a Peter Brock. You don't like leaving any fan without an autograph or a chat or a, you'll, you'll stick around as long as possible. How did the, defu- the tomato farmer become that character and did it come easy to you? In the, in the like, not in the very beginning, but in, in uh, I did a lot of work with Peter Rock. I did a lot of charity stuff with him, a lot of talks with him and stuff like that. And that's where I, um, that's where I sort of cemented it I suppose the, the need for the fans I always loved the fans right from day one I knew they were my bread and butter and uh, I, I was really a fan I wasn't my own fan but I was a fan of everybody else that, that raced and um, I'll just never forget one day with Peter we were both doing a signing for the Brisbane Hot Rod Show and um, so we're sitting there side by side and you know I got a I got I got a couple of hundred people in my line you know and uh, you know waiting and uh, I remember Rockies went four city blocks Right, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, I think like I never ran out of people to sign, but he he had people waiting hours. You know what I mean? And and every single one of them was like the only one he was going to talk to that day. You know, the the way he treated them and talked to them, and what he wrote for them, and and yeah, you know, I I did always did a bit of that. You know, always wanted to know, if, you know, where do you go to school? What do you do? And that sort of thing. And he was the same, you know. And that sort of cemented what I was doing. But in the early days, that burnout that you're talking about, that's still on videos on on Google. You can Google that up. And um, what it was, this might take away from it a little bit, but I, I just Graham Eason had just rolled his dragster down the quarter mile at uh, X Service Paradise, and I bought the motor out of it. So me and Marie, instead of giving the, all the old tomato patches to the Italians, we started picking them and selling them to the Italians for three bucks a box. All the old to make juices, they make sauce out of. And I slowly, Graham let me pay the motor off, so I slowly bought the motor, supercharged small block Chevy it was. Mm-hmm. I'd only had nitrous engines in that car up until this. This is the old original black car. Okay. And uh, so I used to go to summer nats all the time, have fun, you know, and just drive her all around. I was, just, I was one of the freaking idiots down there. And um, we uh, we had, they had the burnout, and they said, oh, we're going to do some burnouts this year. And I said, oh, yeah, it sounds good, you know. I've done a couple of burnouts in my time, you know. <laughs> So um, so we get in there and I, and I just had the big supercharged motor and I hadn't done nothing with it. I drove it around the summer nuts a few times. That's all I'd done with it, you know, and hadn't done anything with it. And it had, it had like 1,100 horsepower. The most horsepower I'd ever dealt with was probably four or 500. So anyway, Mick Athold was down there and he was sort of teaching me how to do it, and that, you know. And he says to me on the start line, he goes, uh, I'm, I'm sitting there and I've got thousands of people, tens of thousands of both sides, you know, protective of hay bales. And, um, it is a crazy mega event. <laughs> it is. And a big long straight and they've got a camera up the front there, right? And he says to me, um, okay, so just get out there and just flatten it in low gear, right? And 
when the red light comes on or you think it's going to, I just shift gears. It's two-speed power glide. I said, oh, okay. So I get out there and I start doing the vernet, blow the belt brakes. Well, so I pushed it back in the corner. I thought, oh, I'm never going to get another blow belt, you know. Where to get a blow belt from? Anyway, some guy jumps the fence and uh, says, you need another belt, mate. So I'll go full line of my car. <laughs> so he runs over, whacks it, rips his belt off his car, rings it back, just happened to be the right one, whacked it on the car, went out there. So Mick says again, he's at the window. You can see in the video, Mick at the window, walk up and he leans in and he says, righto. He says, don't forget, just low gear, flatten it, and when the shift light comes on and you think it's gone too far, just shift the gear. So that's what I did and did the biggest motherfucking burnout you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> And I didn't know at the time, but I couldn't stop down the other end. I had a few few of the local locals jumping out of the way because I couldn't stop the thing at the other end. But um, who would have thought, mm. you know, who would have thought? Up until then, the biggest burnouts I've seen were done by Wayne Varva at the Summer Nats in, in the, I think it was the year before. And that's what I thought, oh, yeah, I'll give Wayne, I can run for his money here, you know. And, oh, yeah, it's a pretty serious burnout. And so uh, it's, I still look at it today. I still don't think I've done one as good. I did, might, might have done one as good at Eastern Creek one day when I was mad at some, at, at the car, you know. But other than that, I, that's, and it was done out of naivety, that one. The first one was just, yeah, just, like Mick said, just flatten it and, 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 and flatten and shift gear. And that, just a, another thing, we're down to the 92, 92, um, Nationals at Calder Park, another time Mick just said flatten it, right? And he said, I'm sitting on the start line, I was racing Donna Silsmore, it was a final of, of, um, of Superstock. And uh, he said, right, oh, he said, look, I've changed the front end of it and I've hotted the engine up a bit, right? Now you've got this race won, you just got to remember, it's probably going to carry the wheels, right? So just flatten it, and if you lose the horizon, just shift the gear, okay? And I, <laughs> and I said, yeah, right, eh? So I flattened it, right? And I, the thing came... I started climbing, I lost the rise and shifted the gear and flipped straight over backwards. <laughs> Thanks, Mick. <laughs> Good job. That's that video's on 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 the on Google on video at the moment too, yeah. everywhere. So that gets looked at a lot. Yeah, so thanks, Mick, for your advice. <laughs> Let's talk the commercialization of Victor Bray the Racer. I spoke to Sue Dilger from Castrol for this. Mm. She reckons you, you you have had, mate, some of the longest commercial associations in the history of Australian sport. You're very good at it. Mm. I know that you can take your cars to mining towns and hold court with, with miners and, and happily be in your blue shirt yep. just shooting the breeze with them. And then a day later, you could be in a corporate office in Sydney somewhere in a, in a suit stitching a, a deal together. I know that is something that you're you're very good at. But it didn't always start that way, did it, <laughs> mate? She reckons she can recall, you know, kids with no undies running around, hot dog wrappers on blowers. <laughs> 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 it changed a lot over time, didn't it? Yeah, it did. I mean, I never thought I was going to be a drag racer. You know, like I said, I used to work on my car and my old Chevy and used to have a lot of fun doing it, you know, and, um, you know, it slowly built it up with the help from uh, Feet Smith and Dennis at DP Autos. Um, if without them, I would never would have. I probably never would have got going because I just didn't um, didn't have the money or anything. But they allowed me to run an account there, and um, so that's all I was doing. Was just you know, do this carvey one day, maybe some this a bit of nitrous. One of the things I used to have nitrous oxide. Well, Dad had a um, you know, there wasn't a lot of money floating around the farm, and Dad had an account at um, VAC at the time. Okay, and um, I used to book all my nitrous up on it. <laughs> And he used to he used to look at it and he used to go, "What's this stuff here? Night the socks." So what did you I didn't, tell him? I didn't buy any night the socks. So and I said, "Oh, Dad, that's what I use in the car." <laughs> how, how come it used forty bottles? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he, he 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 was good with it and um, used to used to be happy for me to do it. Not not happy for me to do it. He used to let me do it. Yeah. I think the fact that you've stayed true to who you are has actually resonated in a lot of places, mate, from boardrooms to the ordinary man. Yeah, well, I am. Like I said, I'm a fan of 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 uh, everything of of drag racing and of people that drag race, and you know, and I just love doing what they do. And and it's my only opportunity I got is is to have sponsors. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it at all. And uh, to to interact with the fans, like I, you know, that's one of the things I really love. That's one of the things I've missed since I had the, the cancer operation is because uh, I don't talk exactly the same as I used to, and I struggled for a long time to talk properly. And uh, yeah, just looks and that that I, I suffer at the moment. I, um, I you know don't interact with the fans probably as much as I do. I still do, but not as much as I used. I used to just love. I used to get. I used to sit on the ropes there for hours and hours just chatting with them. You know what I mean? And uh, probably don't do as. I think it's. I'm a lot. I think I'll be a lot better from now on. You know. I think I've had some good things happen in the last yeah. some operations I've had recently. 
But um, yeah, 1998, 1988, I should say, uh, a guy called Vils Leckenhorst, who was a um, big fellow, who was a, a rep for Castrol, come and saw me and said, um, um, yeah, they told me you were doing all right the drags and that. And I said, yeah, I'm doing okay. So he's, <laughs> he said, uh, so I wouldn't mind, you know, do you want interest in putting some a sticker on the car for some oil product. And I said, oh, yeah, that'd be great, you know. Well, that's where it started. And over the next few years, it grew into something pretty serious. And in them days, you know, you know, basically, when I was street racing, I was working for 80 bucks a week on the farm and earning $1,500 a week in racing. <laughs> racing. Yeah. And uh, then when I went, uh, when I when that sort of happened, all of a sudden, you know, I'm, you know, I'm getting tens of thousands of dollars. And... I can afford to actually race my car. So it was something I really wanted to pursue. Mm. And I did for the next, however long that's been, 88 till 2019. You know, it's something that I pursued my whole life because I could see that, uh, I remember a story years ago, John Force in the United States and um, and Gary Dencham, uh, I remember a conversation they had that they made public was Gary Dencham was a school teacher and John Force was a truck driver. And... Uh, John Force said, uh, Gary Dencham said, oh, geez, I'm going to, I need a few more parts. So I'm going to put a few more hours in at school in the next few months and see how again. John Force said, I'm going to give up my truck driving job and go and sell some, go and sell like, cars on the corner or something and, and feel I'm going to find myself a sponsor. That's how I'm going to go drag racing. Well, now Gary Dencham is still a school teacher and John Force is a multi million dollar drag racer. Absolutely. So, you know, it is motor racing is an opportunity to advertise products into the public. Mm. That's what it is. It's because it's a great thing, especially products that are related to motor racing and motor cars mm. and automotive and stuff. So, and, uh, you know, I've met some fantastic people inside these companies and you do have to, it's changed a lot over the years. Once upon a time, you could get a sticker on your car for, you know, advertising as a sticker on your car. And I had this chat with Larry Perkins once. That changed around about the time I was associated with Castrol and Larry and everyone was there. It turned into if you don't become a part of their business and get a good solid return that they can they leverage. Can, they can leverage, mm-hmm. you're not going to be there much longer. So that you know, and that's you know, Larry's smart smarts in that area mm-hmm. sort of got me thinking. Yeah, that's right. You know, I got to start visiting their customers and I got to start going there. I got to you know still interact with the fans as much as I did, but I really do have to be a part of their business. And nowadays, if you're not returning four or five times the money they're giving you, mm-hmm. you ain't going to be there because that nowadays the, the, it's business to business yes. and uh, that's all there is to it, you know. It, it's tough. It's tougher now than it was back then. And uh, I think, you know, that's something that I suppose is a little a lot harder to do than what, what originally was. Over time, you've talked about seeing the benchmark keep dropping down and being blown away by, you know, don't, didn't think you'd ever get to that marker and so on. The holy grail in, in relatively recent time has been chasing that that five second. You were able to do it, I think, at the Perth Motorplex. But the path to that was, was tough, mate. It had effectively been a bit of a correct me if I'm wrong here, a bit of a, a drought for you. Zap, I think, had done it in 2007. But November 2012, Golden State's event in Perth, first five second, and then you went on to win the final against your arch rival, John Zappi. I mean, that was an amazing moment in your career. Wasn't it? Yeah, it was. You know, Zap ran a five well before anybody else. And then, uh, well, the United States ran them first, you know. They ran a couple over there. Zap was right up there with them, that's for sure. And... Um, he ran the first five, and then there was um, uh, a lot, a lot of. They sort of flowed into flow of it after that, you know. I mean, that's sort of the way that. Why was it so hard for you to get to, mate? What happened there? Well, Venny ran, Venny ran six o two, and I ran a six o two about two years before that went a five, and then it just went away. It just, it just the tune ups come and go. I mean, drag racing is something you got to keep you really keep your eye on. I suppose. I look at drag racing a lot more as fun than chasing the the things. It's nice when you get them, mm. you know. And the first one I got. So you weren't obsessed with it. You weren't. I wasn't obsessed with the five. No, I would have loved to run one. So would Benny. Would have loved to run. I think he ran. I think Benny ran a string of six oh ones and six double O's. So close to a five. Yeah. You know? yeah. But years ago, when me and Les Winner were having a bit of a battle on who was going to be the first to run um, a six, I think it was back at the time, yeah. and um, I ran. It was over forty six double O's. Right, and the 601, 600, 602, 606, 605, all this. Uh, no, that was not six, it was a, a seven, seven, yeah. seven double O, seven double O, seven O O, seven O. Let's get a laugh out of this. And um, 
it just went on and on. And he was in the seven ones and seven twos, and I'm thinking this is going to just happen one day for me, you know. Then one day he goes six ninety nine. <laughs> he beat me to it, and I'd run. I think it was forty six or forty seven, something like that. Six o somethings that I'd run leading up to it. That pretty much belted me chasing things. You know, that was that was, oh, it was just too hard. And because I used to do everything to try and get that last little bit, I just couldn't get it. You know, and, um, and that's the same with when me and Vinny were trying to run that first five. You know, we ran a lot of six oh ones and stuff like that, and long before anyone else was going that fast. And that come along and did it, and that's just the way it goes. Amazing. That's the beauty of drag racing. The beauty of drag racing, exactly. And if those numbers that we've just rattled off for you uh, sound a little foreign because you're perhaps into another area of automotive or another area of racing, it's it's the the barrier, the the six or seven second barrier, whatever it may have been, over the quarter mile. Yeah. I mean that that is. Even just to comprehend that, mate, for the style of car you race, I don't know they pull some incredible horsepower. That is just. To stop and fathom that, that it's all over in that period of time, the distance you cover, the rate with which you get to 100, I mean, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? Yeah, it's crazy, and that's the beauty of it. I think the the way that sport's gone lately of the, the, big, the big gains, um, say in the early 2000s to the mid-2000s, the big gains were new superchargers, better superchargers, and uh, better magnetos, better electronics, mm. and um, stuff like that. You know, now the last say four or five years, the big gains have been chassis, mm. and uh, you know people learning chassis. Chassis getting better, learning more about chassis. Like e- each door slammer that you see out there has got nearly forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of shock absorbers on it. Amazing. You know, so um, you have to have them all around. You got to have what you got to have, and mm. it, to keep up with the rest of the guys, the knowledge that they have on four links, the knowledge a lot of guys f- pick up from the US. And uh, you know, traveling there and getting buying US cars that are ready to go, you know, is uh, is a lot of um, a lot of where the ETs now to come from. But yeah, the cars are so fast now. Like I said, after I had a break and got back in it, I thought to myself, "Wow, I'm never going to catch up with these guys." But uh, you know, it's good. I'm starting to really enjoy it again now. I'm running the five eighties, and I think my old cars. See, my car's an older car too, and I run a whole different type of rear suspension than them. They do have an advantage in the suspension area in some areas, but I still believe that I have an advantage in other areas. You know, I don't. I think my stuff's more stable than theirs and uh, their stuff's just a little bit quicker in the 60 foot than mine. After 60 foot, there's no difference in the two cars. But, um, you know, it was good the other day when I went down there and I left the start line. Vinny hopped a ride up and uh, we went down to start line and I hopped up, I did the engines. Vinny does all the transmissions and stuff and the, and the four links and stuff. And uh, we hopped her up and went out there and uh, the thing drove out and from 60 foot to about, you know, 300 foot, the front wheels were a good foot and a half in the air. So, you know, we make changes to keep them on the ground because that's, that's pretty dangerous stuff. And, uh, you know, it just shows that the car's still got it in. It's, I think, how do I, I think I built this car, Murray built this car for me in 2002. Mm. So it's 17 years old. So It's good that you bring Murray up. Let's talk about him because you, you've got some good long-term people that you've had wonderful relationships with along the way. And from a, a car building, a, a chassis point of view, he's been a... A, a real important part of the framework of, of Victor Brian racing, hasn't he? Murray's been a big part of the framework of door slam racing in the world. Mm. Um, some of the stuff that he's did, well, he built a car, uh, or me and him, I've, I've paid for it, but he built a car for Scotty Cannon when Scotty Cannon was turning. Scotty Cannon was a five-time American Pro Mod champion. Mm. And he comes to, I've brought him over to Australia, got friends, and I've brought him over to Australia. And uh, he come and raced over here for a whole season in, in the car. And then he liked the car, so I took it back to America. Well, it's got the same rear end that mine's got. It's called a swing arm rear end, which is basically a ladder bar that's been beefed up in all torsional directions. And um, a lot of people don't like them, just say, you know, they're crap, that's hell history and stuff, you know. Well, he went over there, won another championship in that. And, and then he sold it, and it's actually been used as a nitro methane burn and door slammer since for the reason that it's stable. It's okay. stable down the racetrack. Um, four links have. Four link cars don't usually don't have the diff square in the car, mm. and they don't have even uh, the wheelie bars. Uh, the two wheelie bars at the back aren't the same height off the ground, and that's all. So the car goes straight when they leave the start line, okay. you know. So because that's that they use a um, uh, very high high tech engineering base. So when you get down the other end of the racetrack. The, the the rear end isn't even in the car, you know what I mean? It's twisted or it's, it's, it's yeah. yeah. It doesn't bother them ninety mm. percent of the time. Mm. But I mean my car's uh, down the other end, it's dead even all the way around. Okay. So you know, it's two it's two different things, you know. Yeah. And uh, they believe their way's right and I like my way and I am gonna start developing I I've seen some good stuff in this car now that we're really hotting it up. Mm-hmm. So I'll just I'll just have a crap. I mean everyone used to run four, run ladder bars once yeah. and this just hopped up ladder bar, you know. Love it. 
I want to tell a funny story if you're up if you're up for it. It's <laughs> possibly a bit of a uh, frightening tale as well, but it's a great one because you've talked about buying other cars and acquiring them over over the years. Your lovely wife Marie has been a mainstay with you, mate, at every race and by your side as you've battled cancer and all sorts of things. You went to Mexico once to buy a car for her that you had your eye on. Share with me what you can, because I think you thought that, you know, putting a bit of cash in the back pocket and and crossing the border would be just like going from Queensland to New South Wales and picking up a car you'd seen on Gumtree or in the Trading Post or whatever, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, it's another day that the, the naivety of Victor Ray showed very greatly. Now, we were at the Pomona Swap Meet. Pomona, Pomona Swap Meet at the drag strip there, uh, fairgrounds. They have a big swap meet there every few months. and So we are there, and me, it was me and Marie and Troy Critchley, and uh, we are walking around looking at all the cars and what had happened earlier, uh, Marie had a 1958 Chevy here in Australia, had a big sunroof in it, a really beautiful car it was. Uh, I needed some parts to go drag racing, so I sold it. Did you it. for it? No way. You <laughs> sold it, did I you? I sold it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I sold it. That wasn't as bad as the time I sold the kids' TV. <laughs> <laughs> to go drag racing? Yeah, drag racing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Things happen. But um, Ben still tells me today I'm an asshole for doing that. <laughs> I bought him another one a few months down the track. We had a little one, they could watch. Anyway, so we, um, anyway, I said to Marie, oh, look, love, you know, thanks for that, and I'll, um, I'll buy you another one one day, you know, I'll buy you another one one day, somewhere down the track. Anyway, so we walk along the swap meet, and we see this 58 Chevy two-door um, Impala sitting there with a seven-inch top roof and airbags, right? Awesome. And ho- ho- actually, hydraulics, not airbags, got actually hydraulics on it, and all these Mexicans sitting around it, you know, they were drinking tequila. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Looked like somewhere you wouldn't sort of walk up and say anything to. So anyway, they are all sitting around and I walked up to the car and I looked inside it and it had all, um, what do they call it, you know, the thin cushion and that in there. It looked pretty cool. Everything was pretty nice about it. Anyway, Marie turns around. We weren't there for 10 minutes looking at the car and Marie turned around and said, you know that time you said one, <laughs> one, day, one day you're going to buy me another 58 Chevy? Yeah. And she had this look at her eye and she said, today's the day <laughs> and that's the car. And I thought, oh, Jesus, it's time I better get hold of this. So I looked at it and I looked at it and this, they, they, was, the guys weren't in a state for me to talk to them at the time, you know. They, they were very young. Um, very intoxicated and looked, looked pretty dangerous, <laughs> and uh, it was, it was a, like it was a it was a gang car. It, was a, it, was a, it had a gang thing in the back window. And, oh, oh, oh yeah, and it did have a for sale sign on it. Mm-hmm. Um, they took the gang thing out. All that when I, when I it. So anyway, so I, I we walked around a little bit more. And Marie's there going, "Go get that car. Go get that car. Go get that car. I want that car." <laughs> and um, so that was all it was told. And so I went around there, went back there later on, and I said to the young bloke there, and uh, it was just a young kid there, probably. 12 or 13 years old and everyone else is, is sleeping on the ground, you know, and they obviously drank too much. Mm. This is probably four o'clock in the afternoon and um, I walked up to the young kid and I said, uh, can you, uh, do you speak English? And he said, oh, a little, little, you know, a little, mm. little bit. I understand it, but don't speak too much and all that. So I said, oh, yeah, I just, this car's for sale. And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uncle, whatever, you know, mm. he has these cars for sale, you know. And I said, oh, yeah. I said, I just like to to have a chat with him about it. He goes, oh, no, don't wake Isaiah up now. <laughs> no, no, you can't wake him up. Don't wake him up. He'll fight. Okay. And that was it. And I thought, oh, okay. So, and he looked like he would too. Okay. And uh, so that was sort of it. And I sort of said, well, I'll have to just sort of hang around and see what happens. And uh, the young kid actually gave me a um, a bit of paper, but I didn't understand what he had on. It had, you know, big numbers and stuff on it. But I did notice on the truck, tilt tray they had it on, the tilt tray that was on, I noticed that it had a um, junkyard thing written on the side of it. So mm-hmm. I just said, oh, I remember that, Marie, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's it. We get walking around. Anyway, probably half an hour later, I see that driving at the gate. Gone. Gone. Yeah. Missed it. You know? And boy, oh boy, was I in trouble. <laughs> you know? And uh, it, and they just, they were asleep. And then I just wake up and gone. I don't know how it went, how it happened. Someone else took it. I don't know what happened. Because there was no way in the world they could have woke up and gone, just gone like that. But anyway... That was the end of that. So the next day we jump in a jump in a high car and we're sure down trying to find this junkyard. Okay, so we're down over the border in Mexico and we're going to all these junkyards, guys coming out with machine guns and dogs you couldn't jump over. You know, and we're asking, uh, where's this where's this place, you know? Yeah. And um it they weren't all that hosp- 
hospital. There wasn't a lot of white hospital there. No, they were pretty angry men for some reason. And uh, they were all top shops, you know, that's what they were. And because this car had been made in a top shop, it, that's why it had so much chrome on it and so much modification. Yeah, because it's, it's not been made in a top shop. That's what they do down. That's what the low rider thing started. Anyway, so we go around there. Anyway, one guy ended up telling us, oh, yeah, I've here down there, up there, you know. So, oh, yeah, so we went there and we drove in there and it was a. Um, the guy there said, oh, no, the car's not here. It belongs to such and such. Renardo was his name. Ricardo was his name. And uh, he says, you go here, here, here. It was, it was number. Something or rather, E. E. Street, because the, the the government, American government, in all their glory, had given them this great big housing development, right? Yeah. And it went A Street, V Street, C Street, D Street, <laughs> E Street, and when it got down to Z Street, it went A A Street, V V Street. There was thousands of houses there, all dirt floors and stuff. You know what I mean? And uh, I wouldn't call them slums, but I call them, you know, they were, they were this, ha- cars were inverting the street the night before still smouldering and all sorts of shit going on there so me and Troy Troy's cause Troy's dancing around like an idiot you know thinking ah oh, this is fun and uh, there's ladies going to bingo like it wasn't like it was mm. you know that bad but it, it certainly wasn't one of the nice places to be I suppose anyway so we finally got this house and I seen the car at the backyard and I thought oh you beauty we found it so then so I go inside and I said oh, I talked to a young son in the void said yeah yeah that's in there that's in there and then so I go and then they sort of half spoke English, you know, and there just happened to be this Japanese guy there at the same time trying to buy the car. Oh. He must have seen it at the thing too. So we're sitting there um, and we're just chatting away and, uh, you know, we were really uncomfortable, you know. Th- these guys, you know, they had two guns each in case one, one, one didn't work, you know what I mean? They all had them. They not openly got them. They're not, not like they're hiding them. And there's probably six or seven of them there. And um, so we was just chatting away, talking to him about, you know, the car and how much you want. We wanted 10000 or something for it. And I said, I'd give you, you know, 9500 for it. And then the Jap guy said, oh, I'll give you 9500 for it. And they're getting huddled a bit together. And they, one of the things they come back and they they just said, um, uh, Australian. I got to sell it to the Australian. And then I said, oh, yeah, cool. And the other Jap guy goes, yeah, I want to sell it to me. He says, you von Pearl Harbor. <laughs> what, 50 years later? <laughs> Yeah, so that was that. He was gone. And he got pissed off. So you know, I got the car, and I just said, oh, "I've got to do just pay you a positive. You want me to pay you now for it?" He said, and the, he, his eyes lit up, and he said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Oh, do you want to?" See, what do you mean pay me now? I'm not taking a check, mate. A cash only. I said, "Yeah, no worries. I got it on me." And he just freaked out. They all ripped their guns out, and they looking around, and they. I thought I was gone. I thought they were going to shoot the three of us, take the money, drag us outside, and that was the end of it, right? And I thought I thought it was all over, and. Um, and they, I, they said, they said, you, you, they started abusing me and just started abusing the hell out of me. And they said, what are you doing? What do you think? You got $10,000 US cash on you. I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, you idiot. He said, get outside and get, get taking. He's up huddling and running. We didn't know what the hell was going on. Took us out straight outside, chucked us in the car and just drove us straight back over the border. We followed him, you know, over the border. And he just said, don't you ever come here with that sort of money. He said, there's 100 people within 50 metres of us that would shoot the whole lot of us just to take the money off your dead body. So I figured then we might not have been in the right place. <laughs> anyway, so while we, when we got over the border and the guy said, oh, look, I'll deliver it to such and such an address, he gave me an address. Anyway, next couple of days, um, we went up there when he said to be there and here's the car. They brought it up. I paid him the cash and then we owned it. Funny Car is a type of drag racing vehicle characterised by having tilt-up fibreglass or carbon fibre automotive bodies over a custom fabricated chassis. This gives them an appearance vaguely approximating manufacturer showroom models. They also have the engine placed in front of the driver as opposed to dragsters which place it behind the driver. You brought up a couple of rivalries, so let's bounce through some of them. We'll start with John Zappia. It's been an enduring rivalry, mate. Very different to you. We talked about the fact that he was the first with that that five second pass, and he he was obsessed with beating your records and things, wasn't he? Is that a is that a fair assessment? Yeah, John's a very competitive guy. No matter who's got the records, he wants them back. You know, he was the first to run a seven. I think he was the first to run. I think he was the first to run a, a six. 
in the world in Australia. He's a bit less winner, yeah, but he lives on the other side of the country. He's first to run a five. Uh, he's first to break a lot of barriers, and that's what he aims at. That's what he wants to. He wants his name in the record books everywhere he can get him in the record book. That's his goal. He loves winning. You know, he's got a good team, good strong team, and uh, he's he's a pretty aggressive young fella. You know, he's um, he likes things done the way he wants them done, mm-hmm. and he makes that point very clear to everybody that okay. works for him. You know, and and it obviously works for him. You know, he's got a lot of processes in place that he likes. But yeah, me and John, I can remember racing him over at um, uh, over in Perth. I always got him pretty good in Perth with with the with the crowds over there. I remember an American Wayne um, Wayne someone or other come over with a. Uh, a Ford uh, Thunderbird drag door slam and match race zap over there in Firth and as he was coming up the return road they threw full beer cans at him and yeah, threw things at him because he, I don't know, he must have said something on the start line about you know, I'm going to beat this guy blah 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 they started running zap down and uh, they just love zap over there down, especially down at, at the old um, racetrack down there at Mandra but they um, yeah, threw beer cans at him and yeah you know, uh, I always just got on good with the fans over there, you know, because we always went over there, went over there an awful lot in them days. But John would, he would be able to put a, a race track that was, it was a little bit rough of bitumen and it never got prepared like they do prepare them nowadays. And Zap would, he didn't, he'd hit the wall three times on the way, he wouldn't care. He'd, he'd go over the centre line, wheel stand up, down. That's that's where he learned how to drive. That's why he's like he is, you know. He's He learned to drive on a racetrack and learned to drive fast on a racetrack that, that most people wouldn't have been able to get a car down there. And we raced him a lot and... I remember one day there, he, he wanted to, after he beat me, he in the final he wanted to put my he had his car on the, back on the tilt tray, and he said, well, "Can I borrow your two doors off your car?" I said, "Why is that?" And he stuck the two doors up on the tilt tray and took pictures of it. <laughs> <laughs> so he had something for his little photo album. But yeah, no, John's a very competitive person. Uh, we had a lot. I had a lot of run-ins with him over the years. You know, me and him. Expand on that. Expand on the intensity of the rivalry. Um, oh, well, one incident down at. Cold of heart. See, John's always been in front, and he does what he did. John got John and Brett Stevens got Motex allowed in Door Slammer, mm-hmm. which I was really against because they do have uh, an ECU in them, mm-hmm. and um, you're trusting the the owners and the drivers and the tuners to not use them, mm-hmm. which isn't something that a race pack. Race packs don't have that in them. You know, race packs uh, in the United States. They're not, they weren't allowed to use Motex back in the day, back then. And I was just right against them bringing it in. And John was all for bringing them in. And um, so he had, and then all of a sudden his performances start picking up, you know, more, probably more than likely because he had a lot more data, mm-hmm. more so than doing anything wrong, I would say, at this stage, looking back on it. But I was against it, you know. So we had a lot of clashes there. And. Um, Does it mellow with time, mate? Does the rivalry mellow with time or not? Oh, no, I hadn't talked to John. I talked to John on the phone probably only a week ago now for the first time in a couple of years. So. Did you? Yeah. How did the combo go? Um, his way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we, had, we had some issues to sort out, some new stuff that's getting let it out. In, you know, some, actually, it's the next step. Like If going from race pack to a Motec mm-hmm. is 10 points, mm-hmm. they've brought out a thing called a fuel tech. right, which is another step again. So if, if race pack to Motec's 10 points, mm-hmm. No tech to race packs, 200 points. It's the best of the best of the best of the best of technology today. And everybody's using it and it's making people go faster. And we're just having a – some guys want to use it in, this, in door slammer mm-hmm. and they probably have to have a vote soon to see whether they're going to let in or not, you know. Okay. And um, so he was bringing me up about that and he always takes the opportunity to um, – he's, he's, a lot of people don't realise John's got a photographic memory. He doesn't miss anything. He can. You ask him. I raced you back in Cold of Hark, John, and when you did this, I went this, and you went that. And he goes, "That's not how you did. You only went a six one seven at two hundred and twenty six, and I went six oh four, and I beat you the other end by three car lengths." And that's how he is. He can recall every run he's ever done and everywhere because he can see it. He says he has a photographic memory. It's amazing, yeah, and. Um, he, and he can recall every bit of data, every tune-up, main jets he used to use, whatever he had in. He just knows everything about that car, your car, and everyone else's car. It is. It's incredible. Motor racing is is built on the the characters. So I, I you know, I'm pleased that you've spoken, but I, I love the rivalry story. Mm. You brought up Brett Stevens there when when he was a part of it, mate. How heavy was that rivalry between the pair of you, and how did you feel about mm. it? Um, Brett Stevens, Brett, me and Brett Stevens were great mates for ten years, and uh, used to go to summer nights together, and used to do a lot of stuff together. And 
you know, Red always enjoyed a drink and sometimes we'd, we'd have a bit of an argument or something or we'd turn up at home full of piss and I had to run him back home again or something like that, you know. And that was okay. But then along come drag racing and I convinced him to buy a door slammer, which most people still bag me for today, saying that it's all my fault. And... Um, he, uh, Red had an enormous ego, you know, like he said, he just loved centre of attention. He just loved it, you know what I mean? And uh, and he had his motorbikes. And, you know, i got to say, I've never seen anyone ride a motorbike as good as he rides a motorbike or tunes a motorbike. Wow. He was fantastic at it. And then when he started driving door slams and funny cars, he was fantastic at that too. He was a great door slammer driver and a great funny car driver. He was an excellent team manager. I thought he was a bit strict, mm-hmm. you know, and wasn't he didn't wasn't there for friends. He was there to see success, and uh, he had a lot of people that you know worked for him. And and what what happened was we could talk outside the racetrack, and as soon as we drove through that gate, he just turned into a different person. You know, to me, he he wanted to be everything everything that I sort of was up until that stage, you know, and I kept explaining to him, you've actually passed me, Brett, <laughs> you know, you, you've got more cars, you've got everything going for you mm-hmm. and, um, and uh, you know, like just one instance years ago, we were down in Sydney and uh, we still, we always sort of talked and never, mm-hmm. never really got on for the last 10 years or so and we're down in Sydney and uh Rick comes into our tent and he's had a couple of drinks and we'd had a couple of drinks and he puts his arm around Marie and Ben and a couple of the crew guys and he goes, oh, look, you know, I want to draw, I want a truce here, you know, and uh, you know, this is this is no good. I'm not liking not being your friend, you know, all the rest of it. And I said, yeah, okay, so I'm happy with that. And he said, so, he said, all I just want to know, I said, you know, what's wrong, with, what's gone wrong between us? And I said, um, oh, I don't want to bring that up, Rhett, you just get angry with me, you know, and that. And he says... Uh, and I said, oh, and he said, oh, look, I just think, you know, he just kept making, he made me say it, right? And I said, oh, I just think, you know, if it's self-centred and stuff and you don't sort of, you know, let other people do what they want to do and that sort of stuff. And uh, probably a little more than that. I probably said a bit more than that. And then he looked at me, he stared at me. I thought he was going to get angry and hit me, right? And he says, oh, see, I can't get a straight answer out of you. <laughs> he was a funny guy, he's a, you know. It's a shame that he got tied up and what he got tied up in and and because uh, he was a stage there, he could have been the best thing that happened to drag racing, mate. Rivalry, but in a good way, mm. is also in-house because mm. your son goes racing, does some enormously good things. How proud were you when he first started racing, Ben? And separate to that, mate, when he had the big crash as well, how much did that worry you and, and knock you around? Yeah, well, obviously the crash was a great concern. Uh, I was in the fits at the time. I usually go out and watch his runs, but I I just... 2013, wasn't it? It was 2013? I'm trying to remember the year. Yeah, I'm not sure when that was. He would certainly remember. Yeah, it was Winter Nats 2013. Yeah, yeah and uh, he's racing his turbo car, and uh, the car just did an instant right turn, uh, about 160, 170 mile an hour, and because it turned so sharp, it rolled off onto the roof, and the roof, he come down on the roof on the top of the guardrail, and that's for, that's about as bad as an accident gets. You know, the speedway guys, a lot of guys have had permanent brain damage from that type of accident in sprint cars because they, they tend to want to fly up in the air and land on the roof. Anyway, so I ran down the racetrack. I saw it on the TV. I was watching him on the, on the screen, and then I seen it happen. I thought, that's because then he went, he then actually spun around and around and went down through the lights. He's right down the bottom end of the track. I, mean, I ran down there as fast as I could, jumped in the buggy, roared down there, and he was laying beside the car at the time, and he's, they were checking him out. And I sort of said, "You're all right, you're all right, you're all right." And he said, "I got a really sore back," and I ended up there having three or four broken verte- fractured vertebrae in his back. But and that was because he hit vertically upside down on the car. You know, there's really nothing going to stop that. That's that's the car's not built for that. Drag cars aren't built for that kind of accident. Mm-hmm. Sprint cars are, but drag cars are not built for that kind of accident. Mm-hmm where you come down on the roof because it's just so unlikely. Mm. And um, anyway, he was out for months and months and months and luckily he recovered. When he got to hospital, they found out they had, I think it was four broken, four fractured vertebrae, but one had fractured into his spinal cord and that, that's the one they were really concerned about and uh, that's why they immobilised him for a few days mm. until the initial healing had started in case um, spinal fluid were leaking through the crack, you know, like it was really... Really concerning, yeah. And um, what what happened on that accident was um, in them days we ran shock absorbers that had a mechanical 
um, adjustable, because all our shock absorbers are adjustable, you know, mm. and they're adjustable. You can turn them off on the run, so you're leaving real tight early, and then at a certain place on the track, you loosen them up so the thing goes through all the vumps or whatever else that happens down the track. But early, you want them nearly locked up. And then, then days, there was a mechanical part in the top of the gear. It had two little gears in there mm. that it turned, you know, you hit them electrically, and it turned and changed the setting. Well, one of the gears stripped. So so you get down the racetrack, and as he shifted a gear, um, the shocky broke, and the, 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 the thing broke. So that one shocky dropped straight to nothing, and that's why the other shocky was still stiff, and it just turning straight right. You couldn't, you couldn't think of a worse situation. Yeah. And, and then what happened to that car? And uh, luckily... The, the roof, all the VAR work, because they're not built for that, comes straight down on top of him. And the VAR work was useless because it's just not meant to do it. It's not designed to do that. And uh, he was very, very lucky on that one. That was the second time he broke his rack, actually. He broke his rack here in the workshop one day, and I sold a Vuick. I was delivering, I sold a Vuick Century, and I was delivering it down to Sydney to Graham Cowans. And, um, and uh, it was loading on the tailgate of the truck. The tailgate got to the very top, then was in the car, and the shaft rope snapped and it's come slamming down to the ground and he fractured three vertebrae there and two, luckily three different ones than what he hurt when he had the accident. So he's actually had two broken back so far. So did, did you or Marie, in the wake of the race crash, contemplate stopping? Did it knock you around or was it always a case of he wanted to get back and you were okay with that? Yeah, he wanted to get back. I, look, I would if he wanted to stop, I would have stopped. I was happy to stop then and there. You know, I thought to myself, no, nah, two broken, that's it, you know. Mm. Not, not going to go out again, but it's just... You know, as soon as he could walk over to the workshop here, he was fixing cars again, getting ready to go again, you know. I mean, I need to get out there. He says, you want to do this, I want to do that. And I'm thinking, you can't go yet. You've got to get doctor's clearances and all the rest of it. And and as far as, um, so, you know, the accident side of drag, I mean, drag racing, I've always said, there's two parts of drag, drag racing. It's the cost of it and it's the danger of it is is the issues that if it wasn't for those two things, who wouldn't do it? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the, greatest, <laughs> it's the greatest thing in the world, you know, the speed and the acceleration and the fun that you have and the camaraderie and the rivalries and everything. It's just nothing. It's like living a dream, you know, but um, the two downsides are, you know, the, the, the cost of the sport is expensive and the danger that's inherently involved in the sport. You know, you've seen some marvellous things over the years. People that have, like Sam Fennick, you see some horrific accidents that you think, you know, you don't want to hear the outcome once you see the accident happen because you know it's not going to be good. Next minute he's walking down the track going, damn it, you know, <laughs> and then you see the other side of the coin where, I won't mention their name, but in, in Australian drag racing, the guy just slammed the wall once then in Calder Park and then spent the rest of his life in, in in, veg- in vegetative state, you know, like, and then with, even worse, you know, people get killed. It's just horrendous, you know what I mean? It's um, it's just so random on what happens in a, in, a, in a motor racing accident, especially at 200 mile an hour or 250 mile an hour. And, and then look at Phil Lamartina in Top Fuel. He's doing 320 mile an hour, mile an hour through the lights. The car bends in half, snaps, shoots 25 feet in the air, right, drives down the racetrack. None of it's even on the track. It's all floating around in the middle of nowhere. Lands, bends up, hits the wall again, floats up, slides to a stop. Phil gets out. you got to sort you got to damage his back badly. He gets out and goes, God damn it. You know what I mean? You would not think in a million years that he would have walked away from that accident, but he did. He walked away. And there's I mean, a lot of top field accidents that you would swear line Lou the person was not going to walk away from it, they just walk away from it. And then it's the other way. You see someone just tap the wall or something and next minute they're, they're, they're seriously injured, you know. So that's the two sides of drag race and then talking about Venny's accidents, you know. And Years ago I had a, I had a run in down at Calder Park. We had a car show down there actually and I was doing burnouts down there and I had a bit of an issue and I ran into the crowd. Um, not, not as bad as Troy Critchley did in the US where he, he killed a lot of people, but, you know, there'd be people around today that would still remember that, that were involved in that and um, that sort of thing. And, you know, we've hit a few walls, Gladstone and, and uh, down at Willow Bank one day and stuff like that. But, you know, seeing an accident like Vans and seeing a lot of accidents that have happened, that is the two issues. And I've always said that the cost and the danger is, is, the, is the bad part of it all. Now, as far as seeing Venny come racing... Um, Ben was my crew chief when he was, you know, 14 years old. Mm. You know, he knew how to tune a car. When Ben was nine years old, he could pull a junior dragster motor apart, put it back together, change the cam time and tune it and go out there and race. You know what I mean? Like, he was right into it. And uh, he's always been a bit of a brat, you know, but, 
he'd be in the workshop here and I'd, he'd, he'd be here. This workshop wasn't as big as it was then. And I'd, he'd move the truck, you know, 10-year-old kid jump in the truck and dr- drive the truck out of the way, open the door so he could do burnouts in his junior drags inside the shed here, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And we were out at the Calva at, uh, at the Vernet show out there one day and I got my Vernet car sitting there and um, I did I did a few Ver- I did a big Vernet show and then I was at the crowd you know at the fence yeah 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 at the fence like you do and uh, next thing I hear the Vernet car start doing Vernets again he's fucking been in there when he was fourteen years old <laughs> stole my Vernet car <laughs> and um, yeah so you know he, he had a lot to do early in his life a lot to do to do with motor racing and uh, engines and he, and yeah he would fill an engine for the time he was fifteen in door slammer engines and uh, so then. I started putting a lot of a lot of stuff aside. The old Cusso, we've still got the Cusso, it's down the back there. And I said, Oh, you know, you can use that if you want. And then he started piecing together old vlocks, getting them repaired over Jack Brothers and a couple of old heads and stuff like that. And so when he turned seventeen, and just before he turned seventeen, he said, oh, I want to go racing as soon as I can. So I said, oh, okay, gotta get a license first and all the rest of it. So he um he got uh he got the uh, the Cusso going and, you know, we put it given an old clutch and an old gearbox and everything. He got it all going, right? And we were out at Willow Bank and he's 17 years and two months old. He'd already run one race where he ran a couple of runs down the racetrack and against uh, Debbie Reed put him out and he sort of, you know, first run. So we're at the winner. This was the winner nationals, right? Biggest meeting of the year. I'd contested it 16 times and never won it. It was the only race in Australia I'd never won. So I give him the pep talk, you know, oh, look, Benny, come and race, you know. There's a lot of good guys here this year and, uh, you know, it's 20 cars and the likelihood of use with the old Casso, you know, qualifying is very unlikely. Uh, so just be happy to get out there, do your qualifying and then, you know, give me a hand on my car, you know, from that day on. He goes, yeah, yeah no worries, you know, he's always pretty perky, but we go out there, right, okay. So the I had never not qualified for a race in my life. I'd qualified for every race I'd ever contested and I'd never won the Winter Nationals. Well, you can bet I didn't qualify for that race. He did, <laughs> right? He qualified number eight. And not only did he qualify number eight, he won the frigging thing, right? So he had now won uh, the Winter Nationals before I won the Winter Nationals <laughs> in a car that was going a second slower than everybody just by being sharp on the lights. And um, he won the event. And uh, we're talking later in the event. And he said, "You know, you're ha- saying how hard it is to win the Winter Nationals. He said, it's not that hard." <laughs> <laughs> so I made a sticker up, put it on the back of the car. World's fastest smart ass. <laughs> Still there today. Yeah. I love it. Let's deal, mate, with the cancer. Just around the time of your 60th birthday in in 2017, you are diagnosed with a fairly aggressive form of of skin cancer. How serious was the Prognosis, and you've had to endure, um, you know, a lot of treatment, a fairly heavy operation that I think was like fifteen hours. Just tell yeah. us if you're comfortable with it a bit more about that. Oh yeah, it's I don't like talking about it, but I mean, I, I don't. It's not that I don't like talking about it. I don't like remembering it because it was pretty nasty times. But um, I had an issue with a of a squamous cell carcinoma in the right hand cheek. Um, I, I could feel something not right about it. So I was going to a specialist, skin specialist. I went, I thought, nah, something's not right here. So I went to another doctor, found out it was something very serious. Uh, I went to a series of doctors that were specialised in um, excising cancers from head and neck mm-hmm. cancers. And um, to to uh, the worst of possible thing was they all said it was inoperable. And couldn't be couldn't be done. Did they give you a time frame, mate? What did they say? Yeah, they didn't only give me a time frame. I think it's something that they would have radiated the hell out of, and maybe tried to give you as much, tried to give as much time. But it, I didn't really understand it. You know, at the time it was traumatic. You know, like and I'm there going, oh no, it can't be an offer. I don't feel bad. You know, like things are bad. Anyway, so I ended up going to, into the Royal Brisbane Hospital. I went to a radiologist, and to, to get to get that radiation to try and make it smaller or, 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 or make it last longer. All the, 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 the scare is always that it's it's gone somewhere else in your body. Obviously, that's what the screw is. And, you know, the, the melanomas, there's three types of, um, basically three types of skin cancer. There's a lot more, but there's three vase ones. There's the melanoma, then there's the squamous cell carcinoma, then there's a the vasal cell carcinoma. And uh, the melanoma is really the bad one. That's the one that, you know, a lot of people can't escape. And then the one I had was squamous cell. That's the next worst one. The vasal cell is probably the least... Um, damaging of the three, although none of them are, none of them are nice. 
So it's Guam still can actually go and spread through your body, you know, and that's what we're hoping hasn't happened. happened yeah. um, so anyway, I ended up going to the radiologist. He said that, you know, this is pointless what, we, what you're trying to do here, you know, and all these doctors said that's inoperable. So I'll go to this head and neck clinic at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. So I go to the head and neck clinic at the Royal Brisbane Hospital and a series of doctors come and visit you. They've already viewed all your scan. You go and get all the, every scan they can possibly do. And uh, then these doctors come and visit you under time, and in their own time, mind you, and uh, they donate their time, and then they all go and sit in the room and work out if they can help you. And a lot of the doctors, you know, they said, oh, you know, we don't think this, we think that. You know, I wasn't there at the time, but I, I got a, a rough outline of what happened. You anyway, know, there's a one guy that was that was travelling um, through, through Australia at the time. He's actually an American guy who lives in England, and he trains uh, doctors in head and neck excision. Uh, so he's a specialist, and he said, look, you know, I'm going to make a mess here, but I'm going to. Have, I'm, ha- I'm willing to have a shot at it. I think I can get. I think I can help you. Mm. So um, you know, we we agreed on it, and off we went. And it was a 15 hour operation. I think nine or ten doctors in there, specialists in all different areas, because I had to remove bone, muscle. I had, they had to sacrifice all my facial nerves. So I got like half half uh, palsy and half my face now, and I uh, had a lot of issues, a lot of things since. You know, I think uh, I don't know how many operations I've had. It. 10, 12, I don't know how many it is, you know, facial reconstructions and stuff afterwards. I had a lot of operations while I was in hospital because they did the main excision and then they had to do some other stuff for the ready for the radiation. But then I uh, had um, 30 days radiation in a row. You, ha- you have weekends off and then you have the five days during the week and they zap you and they, the worst part of that is they strap your head with a mesh thing Onto the radio, onto the machine, before they put you in the radio. So you can't move, you can't even move your lips, can't move your nose in there for about 40 minutes of time. Um, but the whole thing is that when you're going through all this whole process, you see people 10 times worse off than you. Mm. So you don't feel bad, you feel like a sook by whinging about it because these, these people are going through a hell of a lot more than you're going through. Even though you're going through an awful lot, there's, there's people up there going through a hell of a lot more. So it sort of evens things out a little bit, I suppose. And, and so when the original operation, um, it made a real mess. You know, when I first came out of the operation, I, I, I wouldn't dare show pictures of that. That was that was horrific. They I had what they called a free flap where they cut the cancer out so you got a great big hole on the side of your face. And like I said, they took out bone and muscle and everything they could take out of there. They had to give up the old nerve there. And um, so they cut a big chunk of your leg out and they stitch it in there. And uh, it's called a free flap because it comes from somewhere. They can do, they can also take one from your back of your shoulders and twist it around so the blood supply stays there. But like they didn't have that option, so they had to cut, find out somewhere they had appropriate blood vessels and take it out of your leg and then put it in there and stitch all the blood vessels back together. That's what took the time, you know, the microsurgeries and stuff. And then you just go and that's it. You go down to, back to the room and stay there for a few months and they service you and had a few issues with a bit of, bit of infection stuff, which is pretty nasty stuff. But uh, at the end of the day, it seems to have got me back home again anyway and back in the race car. Oh, when I was laying in the I thought I'd never get in a race car again. I thought that was all long gone. So it's a, it's a pretty nasty old thing. Cancer doesn't care who it gets, where it gets you. It just makes no sense. But... I certainly there, – there is some upsides, I suppose. I've had a lot of people since um, come up to me, and a couple in particular, um, where their wives have come and thanked me because what they did, they used my situation and the, how I looked there for a long time, how I look now. Their husbands had some issues with their little cancers on their face and they said, I'll get around to it, I'll get around to it. So they've gone, have a look at Victor – Get the hell, get the hell down there now, and or well, there's going to be trouble, you know. And they've gone down there and found out, you know, they were in a serious situation, and but catchable, you know. So, and I've had dozens of people walk up to me at the racetrack and just say, oh, "When we heard about your deal, uh, we went straight down and got checked, and you know, we found this and they found that, and you know, thanks for this and thanks for that." So, you know, there is that side of it, you know. I feel like you're sort of helping some people a little bit, but. Um, I would still rather it didn't happen to me. I'm sure. <laughs> but um, it's it, it's a really r- pretty rough going and uh, we're still, we're not at the end of the road yet, for that way. I know, mate, that you, I can tell that the changes that it has made to you uh, quite understandably, you know, uh, affect how you feel perhaps publicly. But on behalf of all fans, mate, I know they love talking to you. I know they love seeing you at the, at the racetrack. 
Rob Oberg and I spoke a little bit in the in the build up to this. He did a wonderful interview with you prior to your return 12 months later at the, the Winter Nats in 2018, and it went off virally, mate. People were delighted to, mm. to hear from you. Did that give you the confidence to get back <laughs> in the car, knowing that there was that love from fans and things like that? And how much, how much after all you had been through did being back behind the wheel mean to you? How much of a buzz did it give you? Oh, yeah, that day at the Willow Bank, it was pretty awesome for me, and it's uh, like... Like, I still love talking to the fans and that, you know. I know I look a lot different and I talk, talk a bit different, but, um, I, you know, it's uh, at the racetrack, it's, it's, it is different, you know, like you're still talking to the fans. I don't feel, I don't feel different myself, you know. It's, it's a lot of... You shouldn't, of, mate, you shouldn't. It's a lot of... Um, I think I'm still on painkillers and all the rest of the crap that goes with it all, you know, but um, that stuff affects you. Uh, 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 it affects your daily stuff, you know. When you're at the racetrack, I love talking to fans. They don't treat me any different at all, not at all. Yeah. And... Um, you know, a lot of people have um, always asked a question, you know, and I don't mind telling them what's going on. And, you know, a lot of people come up and, you know, you know see me at the track and just say, oh, yeah, like I'm suffering cancer at the moment myself. And we have a bit of a chat for a while, you know, about it and stuff. And uh, I think that day at the racetrack when I, you know, I was very tentative getting back in the car. I thought to myself, you know, because I, I said I thought I would never get back in a race car again. You know, I thought I'd be lucky just to be able to drive a street car down the road. And uh, for a while there, and um, so I get back in the car, I do the run. Anyway, they were still stomping the the stands and screaming and yelling when I got out of the car down the other end of the racetrack. And then when I went back and saw all the videos of what they were doing and like standing ovation and all that, that's that's crazy, you know. I, I knew then I wanted to. I, well, I did want to get back in the car anyway, but I knew then I wanted to get back in the car for the fans so, and I wanted to race again. So I've really, it's not it's it's not easy for me now to get in that car. I used to, Get in the car and race just as uh, easy as getting in your street car and driving down the road, you know. But and it's not that easy anymore, you know. It's it's a little bit daunting. I'm getting better at it, and uh, you know, hopefully, I can get better. I want to get back to the top. I'd really like to win another, at least win another race, if not. But this year, I come fourth or fifth in the championship, so I would like to um, to get you know get higher than that even next year and see how I go. But I mean, we're chasing a sponsor at the moment. If we get one, we're going to go hard at it. We're not going to mess around and. Um, Benny's got his fire in his belly now, and I go, I'm ready to go again. And I feel a lot better now than I did when I first got back in the car at Willowbank, and I feel a lot more confident in the car as well because I was very tentative that day. You know, I thought to myself, I just want the car to go properly and go down the racetrack and stop at the other end. That's all I wanted to do. I was having how fast it went, and uh, it actually went to 6.30 or something like that, you know, which was to me felt like a 4.50, and uh, <laughs> it, it, it was good. And then the fan response for the rest of that night was just overwhelming and phenomenal and, you know, the emails and the, and the text and all the Twitters and Facebook stuff I was coughing and, you know, all everything was positive, didn't get one one bad one. So, yeah, look, it's I've always sort of raced for the fans because that's what, the way I do, you know, and... Uh, and I still race for the fans probably now more than ever. And I just hope I can give them another three years or more. I'd like to go, hey, there's guys in the States running and racing in the late 80s. Not that I think, not that I, <laughs> not that they, I have any intention to do on that, but I'd love to get another three years minimum, maybe even a little bit after that in lower classes or something, you know. But uh, we'll just wait and see. You know, I, I, I'm sort of guided by doctors and health at the moment. So, um don't worry, I'll push him. When I told the doctor what I do, and I said, you know, will I be able to drive again? He goes, oh, you'll be able to drive, all right. And I said, oh, yeah. I said, um, uh, so you're happy to sign that off? And he says, sign what off? And I said, so, like, you know, sign off to the sanctioning body for the race car. He goes, what do you drive? <laughs> and, and I said, drive a five-second, 400 kilometre hour door slammer. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, you do what? And I said that, and he goes... Oh, I don't know. He said, you shouldn't be doing that anyway. <laughs> but they signed me off. They signed me off and um, they lowered my medication. I got, I got a medication regime around the events so that I lower down to virtually nothing while I'm actually racing yep. and then I get back up afterwards. So everyone's been a great help. Uh, you know, I actually and Andrew have been a great help to help me get through that part of it and, and get l- licensed to drive again And because um, it's some of the medication I take is pretty savage. Yep. And uh, yeah, everyone's every, everyone's been great for that. Everyone's been good. Keep doing it, not yeah. just for the fans, for you too. I know you you get a, a buzz out of it. I, I, I want to finish, mate, this wonderful chat that we've had. Thank you by recapping something that 
Australian Story did. They did a wonderful feature on you a few years back. And there, there's a line of voiceover in there that Rob Oberg reminded me about. I think it goes something like, after winning six championships, uh, you, the ABC reckoned that your proudest achievement was your best tomatoes at the Royal National Show four years running. <laughs> I would think, mate, after this chat, from six championships to world records to fastest passenger rides. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you've achieved along the way, mate. And to see you here today, uh, knowing what you've battled and the fact that you're still doing it, I, I think I love the tomato yarn, but I reckon there's other stuff that you should be equally proud of. Oh, yeah, I'm very proud of my family, that's for sure. You know, my mum... Uh, Mum and Dad, they 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 were fantastic. I had a fantastic childhood, and uh, worked hard. I always had a work ethic. My dad made sure we worked hard our whole lives, you know, and that's how it worked. Still today, that's why I like working and enjoy working, and that's why I got back and worked straight away. You know, doctors, you know, you have to have two years off, and I'm thinking, yeah, right. They walk out the door and go, "What's he know?" You know, <laughs> like, and uh, but yeah, you know, very proud when Vanny started racing. That's for sure. I'm proud of my two grandkids racing, and proud of. To Jack and Josh and all my grandkids, they're all doing what they want to do, and I just want them all to be happy. You know, Marie's been great over the years, so the family's probably, the, as everyone would say, they're the most important thing in the life. But um, as far as the tomatoes go, I'm a tomato farmer that goes drag racing. I'm not a drag racer that grows tomatoes, <laughs> and uh, I still grow tomatoes by the way. And I've got a hydroponic outfit here on the in the work. I kept enough ground when Mum sold the property, and I've got a hydroponic farm. Just out the back here. You're a proper geneticist. You understand how to make really good ones, I'm told, mate. Is that right? We actually, when Dad passed away in 2000 and I was away racing, I left I left and went full-time racing in 1998 and uh, Dad told me to piss off and go get Dad in his system, you know. <laughs> I think that's in the Australian story too. I think it says that in there. He'll go. He'll be back. And um, I, uh, the, some of my brothers and sisters took over the farm. Well, they actually lost the variety. And uh, so... I searched high and low for it ever, and uh, and it's a variety called uh, Summer Taste. It's actually called Rondelay. We named it after my dad, and uh, his name was Ronald. And uh, so anyway, I was looking for this variety called the Yates got it and called it Summer Taste. And uh, so they're selling it all around the place. Anyway, so I'm looking everywhere for it, couldn't find it. I've high and low. I'm stopping at every little mum and dad shop everywhere I travel to, every all over Australia, down south, everywhere. Sydney Racetrack, they've got a big tomato farms all behind that. And every, couldn't find it anywhere. I was up at Gimphy one day at you know, Helltown Hot Rods up there, had a charity day. So I was up there, then I decided to drive home through Kilcoy. And uh, just, I was only 57. So I drove out there. We're all down the road, and I'd stop at all the mum and dad, little, little shops on the side of the road, little fruit shops. And I stopped this one fruit shop, and I walked in. I instantly recognised the tomatoes. I thought, I said, uh, well, I had a friend of mine with me, Vic Wiley, and he says, um, I looked at that, and I walked in, I picked one up, and I looked at it, and I turned it, I can just, because I've, I've grown tomatoes in my life, I can just recognise that is, these are, I said, the guy, I said to the guy, can I try one of these? He goes, yeah, they're, they're seconds. These were seconds sitting on in the boxes for cheap. So I grabbed one, I split it out, and I tasted it, and I said, oh, he said, these are summer taste, right? And I said to the guy, I said, oh, yeah, no, I don't think I'll have any. He said, they don't seem to taste too good, you know, they, they're a bit sour. And he looked at me and he said, well, that's bullshit. <laughs> he, he said, this... He said, that variety, we've been keeping that variety ourselves on and off for the last 12, 15 years. And I said, oh, longer, I think it was. And I said, oh, yeah. And he said, me and, a, me and a mate are the only two that have got it. Everyone else lost it. And I said, oh, what's it called? He said, oh, summer taste. I said, I have two boxes, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> mate, thank you. I, I really look forward to coming back and having another walk around the workshop here. All the dogs are named after legendary races, which I think is super cool. And I want to hear, mate, when I do come back for maybe another Rusty's Garage about some of the resto projects. You've got plenty of them to work on and uh, and I know that'll keep you busy. So go get them. I love the restoration stuff, love the drag race and love the fans, love the family. And uh, I'm very, very fortunate at this time in my life to actually be here to be able to enjoy it. Rusty's Garage is written and presented by me, Greg Rust. Series producer and editor is Alex Mitchell. Audio production by Darcy Thompson. Listener.